Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, the Merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, dear viewers. Welcome to night's lecture organized by the UK Talim Department. As per our tradition, we will start with the recitation of the Holy Quran. Can I request um, Dr. Tayyib Amasad to recite a portion of the Holy Quran? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Translation In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, by the time, surely man is ever in a state of loss except those who believe and do righteous deeds and exhort one another to preach truth and exhort one another to be steadfast. Zakala. Zakala. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of being joined by Jonathan Butterworth, who is serving as a National Secretary New Ahmadis under Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK. As always, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. These will be put to Jonathan Butterworth on your behalf in the last 15 minutes. Please type your questions into the live chat and kindly ensure they are relevant to tonight's topic, Islam and spirituality in the West. It gives me a great pleasure to hand over to Jonathan Butterworth's side. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> and this means um, may the peace and blessings of Almighty God be upon you. Uh, is one the Muslim greeting means. So, thank you very much, and it's a it's a great uh, blessing and honour to be able to attend and present um, a lecture this evening in this uh, Talim lecture series. There's quite a lot to go through, so I'll start straight away. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the Gracious, the Merciful. The topic of my humble address this evening, you can see on the screen in front of you, is Islam and Spirituality in the West by my humble self. There's a PowerPoint, and that'll be controlled by Brother Nadeem Rahman Sahib. If I can request that that comes up now, please. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> Uh, if I can go to the first slide. So as you can see, there's a number of things that need to be defined in relation to this topic. And they are Islam, spirituality, and the West. So let's do that straight away. Go to the next slide. So Islam is a very misunderstood uh, topic. Um, which you'll all know, but particularly at this time when you have the Vienna attacks, the tragic Nice attacks, the Paris attacks, all sorts of attacks, numerous London attacks, etc. Uh, it's, it's, it is highly misunderstood. Um, so we need to define Islam. So Islam, as you can see at the top, <clears throat> you have the Arabic written and it means submission, peace, and the religion of Islam. This is taken from the five volume commentary and that's by uh, His Holiness Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmoud Ahmed, uh, who was the second uh, uh, worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And he wrote a phenomenal commentary on the Holy Quran, which has five volumes uh, in English, 10 volumes in Urdu. So from this, we know that a Muslim is one who submits entirely to the will of God. And the key point to notice, or the key point to note, is that Islam is just an Arabic word. 
if you take it into another language, then it has the same meaning, essentially, of how Buddha would have described his practice, uh, which was surrender and equanimity, very similar to submission. Um, again, put it into Aramaic, it will be almost identical to how Jesus would have described his practice of spirituality. Islam is just the Arabic term for this practice of, of submission and submission and surrender to the to the will of God and of the state of peace, internal, external peace. So in reality, Islam is 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 in reality a state of the heart of spirituality. And we'll come on to that in a moment. But the key point <clears throat> is that Islam has a central tenet, which is that there is one God. There's one core message which has been given throughout millennia to mankind, humankind. However, it's been given by hundreds of thousands of messengers to every country in the earth and to every people on the earth. And Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, was just one of those messengers. An absolutely remarkable man and remarkable messenger, but he was one in a series of messengers. Islam is not a monopolistic faith which suggests that religion started and ended with Muhammad and wipes everything else out. Rather, it, it recognizes that there's a long chain of messengers and that the core message has been given to humanity from the beginning of, of the evolved state of man at the point at which man became spiritually aware. So if we, if we look then at the, at the slides, um, then what you have there is that this message is given very clearly in chapter 2, verse 286 of the Holy Quran, where it states in the name It states that this messenger of ours believes in that which has been revealed to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. All of them believe in Allah and his angels and in his books and in his messengers, saying, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, we hear and we obey. We implore thy forgiveness, O our Lord, and to thee is the returning. <clears throat> Key point there is, we believe in one God, but we believe in all of his books and in all of his messengers. Not just we believe in the Holy Quran and, and in the Holy Prophet Muhammad, but in reality, we believe in all of his books. So we're talking about a large number of books there the Torah, the Gospel, the Bhagavad Gita, the Dharmapada, and all of his messengers. And in fact, you can't be a believer unless you accept all of them. And then an example of this, which is very striking, which you can see on the slides, on in chapter 2, Surah al-Baqarah, um, when, when we look at the slides there, then uh, what, you, what you can see is that it states, and who will turn away from the religion of Abraham, but he who is foolish of mind? Him did we choose in this world and in the next? He will surely be among the righteous. When his Lord said to him, submit, he said, I have submitted to the Lord of the worlds. If you notice two things, firstly, it says the religion of Abraham. It doesn't say the religion of Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says the religion of Abraham. And that's very striking. That means that Islam is actually in the Holy Quran. God Almighty is telling the believers to proclaim that they accept the religion of Abraham, they will not turn away from the religion of Abraham. And then even God said to him, submit. Now, if you remember, submit is the essence of Islam, surrender to the complete command of God. And so, in fact, Islam is described as having predated the Holy Prophet Muhammad and going back to the earlier messengers. There's another element to this, which is the evolution of religion, which is that, in fact, it's become more and more refined and beautified and uh, and, 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 and detailed. But the key point there, which I would like to just humbly make, is that actually it's the religion of Abraham that we're talking about even, and the religion of Adam and the earlier prophets. So this means, in light of those uh, verses of the Holy Quran, which have just been described there, then in fact, to be a Muslim, you have to accept all of the messengers of God and make no distinction amongst them. And that is Islam. And the result is the surrender to the will of God, the full acceptance of the will of God, the full submission to the will of God, the resignation to the will of God. And then amazing things happen from there is the claim of Islam, which which will be touched on in a moment. If we go to the next slide, please. 
So then turning to the West, the spirituality will be defined shortly, but the background to this is that there's a huge decline of organized religion in the West. The West here, I'm, I'm defining as Northern Europe and Northern America, because Southern Europe is quite different. Spain, Italy, Portugal have different religious demographics. Even North America has different religious demographics, as you can see right now with the election and the various things which are at play there. But we're talking for the sake of describing the West as North America and North Europe. And there's a large decline of organized religion. Um, the, just one example there from the Pew Research Center, which I'll come on to in a moment, but there's lots of other Pew reports and reports in the UK as well. And in the UK, uh, time doesn't allow it, but in reality, the UK has gone from being almost uniformly Christian 100 years ago in the 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s, and it had been very uniform in being a religious country with majority Christian since the time of St. Bede onwards, going back into the 7th and 8th centuries for millennia, more than a thousand years. And in the last hundred years, you've seen a complete nosedive in organized religion, which was Christianity in the church. And we're now down to less than 50% in the last one or two years. And in reality, faith is held or, or the Christian faith is held by more elderly people. So that rate is only increasing. So we are seeing the end of that form of organized religion in the UK, which has been practiced for millennia. Everybody would talk about it much more if it was relevant and important in people's lives. So, in fact, it's a silent phenomenon because religions no longer or at least attendance of the church is no longer uh, viewed as, as perhaps an important matter. Otherwise, it would be covered in the news. It's such a huge change. So just to go into those facts a bit more, on the other hand, along with the decline of organized religion, you've seen a huge increase in a desire for spirituality. If we go to the next slide. So... There's lots of different statistics on this. The American ones are some of the most interesting. Back in September the 6th, 2017, the Pew Research Center, very reliable uh, stats organization, said that more Americans now say they are spiritual but not religious. And you've got the graph on the side which shows the change. But the, the script, the, the text here says about a quarter of U.S. adults, 27 percent, now say they think of themselves as spiritual but not religious. This is up eight percentage points in five years. That's a huge amount if you think about the American population of more than 200 million, eight percentage points is millions of people. Um, and this is in a five year period. And this growth has been broad based and they say it's gone across all of the American demographic. So in the same way, you're seeing a decline in organized religion in America, interestingly. And you can see that in the graph, religious and spiritual has gone down from 59 percent to 48 percent whereas spiritual but not religious has gone from 19 to 20%. So in America, there's this very profound change which is going on. And then to the next slide. There are mixed findings, and in Western Europe, in Northern Europe, sadly, the area where we live, people dispute this, and there's a bit of an ongoing debate around it. Some people, some academics say that it's a similar pattern. Others say, no, it isn't. It's just removal of religion, removal of spirituality. Going to the next slide, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, this is just some of the statistical research there. And then the next slide again. Um, very uh, humble observations. Uh, I think for Northern Europe, actually, um, and North America, I think for all of us, we probably have ha had very similar experiences of talking to people. And in reality, I'm not talking to any particular religion here. There may be Ahmadi Muslims watching, there may be non-Muslims and people of no faith, atheists. If you talk to the average person in the street, uh, average non-Muslims um, or Muslims, then I think in reality you have some similar patterns which maybe aren't being picked up so well in some of the Western Europe research. So this is just uh, my subjective experience of, of having talked to friends and family, and, and this is... Uh, what I have found to be the case. And, and it, it does reflect the research, um, but I think also the research 
maybe more research needs to be done. And there's a big academic debate about that at the moment with different professors taking different views. But I, but, but uh, what can be said roughly, I would, I would posit in Northern Europe you, and in the West, you have this, these sorts of changes going on. Many of us feel the following. And this is the spiritual desire which is being seen in the USA. Many of us feel, firstly, a desire to be better, kinder, less selfish, and true to ourselves in order to work out who the real us is. In addition, many of us feel a sense that there is a purpose to our lives and life after death. And finally, many of us feel that uh, there may well be um, that uh, if we just go back to that slide again there, many of us feel that in reality, there may well be a possibility that there is a universal consciousness, also known as God, or at least we are open to that idea and, and that the people uh, express an openness to that idea, not necessarily to the term God, because there's a lot of baggage with the term God, but to there being a universal consciousness. If we go to the next slide. So looking at this first topic of a, a desire to be better, less selfish and true to ourselves, um, then what we see is that in reality, a lot of us ask a number of questions in relation to this. And uh, here are just as some of these questions that I think many people ask themselves but don't know what, where to find the answers. Because the church appears to be less approachable nowadays, people are leaving the church in many ways, but these questions remain unanswered. So they are some of the following ones in relation to this category. How can I be truly happy? Am I being true to myself? How can I become the real me and fulfill my potential? How can I stop worrying so much about what people think of me? How can I free myself of all anxieties, insecurities, and worries? How can I be a better daughter, wife, sister, mother, or friend? That's for the ladies. And then son, son husband, brother, mother, or, or father, or friend. How do I stop that subconscious stream of self-critical, judgmental thoughts? For example, <clears throat> and th these, these are subconscious thoughts which many people have. Uh, but which are not often expressed. Uh, but just to give some examples here, um, in reality, I think many people will relate to them. You're going out on the street. Do I earn more or less than him? A subconscious stream of thoughts comes from that. And for, for, for men and for women, is this person more handsome, prettier, uglier than me? Where do I stand in relation to this person? Do I have bigger or smaller muscles than him? This is the gym generation. Everybody wants to improve their bodies and change their bodies but it's also coming from a lot of social pressure then you've got number plates is my car newer or older than his or hers his is 2020 mine's 2019 but mine's not mine's 2010 actually so these are some of the inner narratives and everybody will have their own various forms of these but and and, and, and people are very fortunate if they don't but in reality a lot of people will relate to those inner narratives. And in the Western society where we live, how do you deal with that? What's the solution to that? Going to the next slide from there. So I wanted here to give a story, give an account. And perhaps the slide isn't needed here because I can just read it out. But, um, you know, spirituality is not an, an academic thing. It's, it's a lived experience and if it isn't lived then it's not of much value so here's here's a story about one very spiritual man and how he dealt with those sorts of questions his name was al fuzil ibn iyaz may allah may god have mercy on his soul he lived in kufa in iraq and then in mecca and he died in 803 ad <clears throat> so he died 187 years after prophet muhammad so this gentleman, uh, uh, Al-Fazel Ibn Yaz, so he was born in Khorasan in, uh, in the Iraq-Iran era uh, region. And in the beginning of his career, he was said to have been a highwayman, a robber, an armed robber. 
And at the beginning of his career, Fuseli Iyaz pitched his tent in the heart of the desert between places called Merv and Bavard. <clears throat> he wore a sackcloth and a woolen cap, and he hung a rosary around his neck. He had many companions, who were all of them thieves and highwaymen. Night and day they robbed and pillaged, and always brought the proceeds to Fuseil, because he was, their, he was the senior of them. And Fuseil would then divide the loot among the bandits, keeping for himself whatever he fancied. He kept an inventory of everything, and never absented himself from the meetings of the gang. Any apprentice who failed to attend a meeting, he expelled from the gang. <clears throat> then, on one night, a caravan was passing, and in the midst of the caravan, a man was chanting, reciting the Holy Quran. And the following verse reached the ears of Fazael. This is the verse. Is it not time that the hearts of those who believe should be humbled to the remembrance of Allah? When he heard this, it was as though an arrow had pierced his soul, as though that verse had come out to challenge Fazael and say, O oh, Fazael, how long will you waylay travellers? The time has come when we shall waylay you. Fazael fell from the wall crying, and he exclaimed, it is indeed, it is high time indeed, and it's past high time. Bewildered and shame-faced, he fled headlong to a ruin. There a party of travellers was encamped. They said, let us go. One of them interjected, we cannot go, for Zael is on the road. Good tidings, for Zael cried, he is repented. And with that he set out all day, and all day went on his way weeping, and satisfied his adversaries, the people that he'd robbed. <clears throat> and this comes from the book of Memorial of the Saints by Farid al-Din Atur, which was translated by A.J. Arbery, and it's on page 49 of that book. For those Ahmadi Muslims who are listening, then you will have come across this book in Malfuzat, Volume 1 of The Promised Messiah, and Farid al-Din Atur was a Muslim saint himself. He was a holy man. So this captures the imagination of how somebody who wanted to change themselves, transform themselves, or maybe even he didn't, was transformed uh, by these, by these, by these, by these thoughts and by these experiences. Just a question that's come up, and I'll see if I can address it as we go along, which is: Is there an element of fakeness in our own actions? Do we all create our own reality? If yes, then what is true reality? Well, that's a very deep question, very philosophical question. Is there an element of fakeness in our actions? Do we all create our own reality? If yes, then what is true reality? So I think that could well be answered as we go along. So we'll carry on and hopefully that will be answered. But the interesting thing to consider is what caused Fazel to make this huge change in his life. And Fazel is just one example. There are hundreds and thousands if not millions of people who've made similar transformations in their lives and coming from there then the question is what what has this impact on us and is it is it is it limited to the holy quran or as the holy quran itself says do we need to accept all of the messengers that have come to mankind and so if we go to the next slide then actually what we find is an amazing thing that Islam doesn't suggest that um, that we are limited in our in in our spirituality and that we only look to one messenger, not others. Rather, it says accept all of the books and all of the messengers. And so, what we get in Islam and in spirituality, and remember, Islam is just a word which describes the road to God. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but. If you look at the scriptures, then you find actually that um, there's very clear guidance on this and also that they're, that they're uniform in what they say in many ways. If we go to the next slide. So here are some examples. What has Islam, but also the earlier books which we've talked about, said on this topic of becoming a better, kinder, less selfish and, tr and to be true to ourselves. So the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, 
has a very interesting in in the book in the chapter called the divine manifestations it says with minds concentrated on me with lives absorbed in me and enlightening each other they feel ever content and happy so this is how the bhagavad gita says that you can attain happiness in 2020 let's compare that with the dharmapada which is the buddhist book chapter 26 the Buddhist books, the Buddhist scripture says a master is never proud. He does not talk down to others. Owning nothing, he misses nothing. He's not afraid. He does not tremble. Nothing binds him. He's infinitely free. Again, dealing with those points of how do you free yourself from anxiety, from worries, from that incessant conversation which occupies one's mind, unless you find a way to silence that non-stop narrative and then interestingly we see this directly reflected in the holy quran chapter 13 verse 28 where it says oh ye who have believed and whose hearts have rest have found rest in the remembrance of god verily in the remembrance of god to hearts find rest those who believe and do right joy is for them and bliss is their journey's end so you have clear guidance on how to deal with those questions in answer to those questions that many people are asking themselves right now. So that is the spiritual solutions which which are to be found for the people of the West. If we go to the next question, next slide. So, thank you. The next slide, many people ask themselves on the street, okay, the church doesn't seem approachable for me, but what about purpose? Is there any purpose to my life? And I think many of us ask ourselves this question, and, and I say this not just as non-Muslims or Christians or Ahmadi Muslims or people of any faith. I think in reality, it's not about the labels. It's about the internal state of everybody's hearts. And this is the journey of spirituality, and these questions are there for all of us. So these are some of the common questions. Is there nothing more than this in relation to purpose? Is there nothing more than this? than working a nine to five job for 70 years or so, and then we die. Can it be that I exist due to pure chance and there is inherent purpose to my existence? Uh, and the, pardon me, can it be that I exist due to pure chance and that there is no inherent purpose to my existence? Or is there a deeper meaning and purpose behind all of this, behind my existence and the universe around me? If so, what is it? And why is it that everything I love comes to an end? The lattes that I drink and look forward to are drunk. Jobs come and go. Money's earned, but it's spent. I love my family and my friends, but even they will depart from me. Is there nothing permanent in this life, this universe, which I can invest in and hold on to? Anything which is genuinely permanent, which reveals the true meaning behind my existence. So no matter how much Richard Dawkins you listen to, with all respect to him, these are questions that don't go away uh, unless they are considered um, and, and, and require consideration. Um, or do they not? It's a question. Who doesn't want to know if they have a purpose? And if we don't want to know, why don't we want to know? Is it because we've said we don't want to know or because our society has told us it's not a valid question? And that's the reality is that Often we are told that those are silly questions. But what could be more important than that? They're only silly if they can't be answered. But who says they can't be answered? We should be uh, deductive, not inductive. And so we have to consider these questions. So this is the purpose of spirituality, to answer some of these deepest questions. So again, to keep this interesting, then... On the next slide, I, then I've asked, what does this look like in practice? We don't need to go to it because it's another story. And it's an interesting story and a striking one, especially for those who live in big cities and they live in either the northern powerhouses of Manchester. You see all the red cranes at night, all of the buildings being erected around you. You watch the US elections. You see billionaires with so much power around the world. You see the heads of, of various companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, you see people with their own planes and you try to make sense of your own life in light of this. And are you somewhat of a failure if you don't have that kind of money? And are you somewhat of a failure if 
you don't have a 2020 reg or a 2019 reg or if you don't have the right class of car maybe you need i don't yeah i couldn't be sure but maybe you need a a c class not an a class or an e class nothing less you know so how do we how do we make sense of our lives and value to and give and, and understand whether we're living lives of value is it purely on the basis of where we stand in the social order of things so here's a really interesting account that helps us to maybe reevaluate all of those things. So there was a man named Ibrahim Ibn Adam, and there's also many ladies here that could be talked about. These are just interesting ones that are, that were picked out. There's others like female saints, such as uh, uh, Rabia, who lived in in, uh, in in Iraq and Iran near Basra at a similar time to these. Uh, holy holy people, so this is nothing about just men, but this is just one example of a man because he was a king. And there's some interesting things that he did. So his name was Ibrahim Ibn Adam, and he lived in Balkh, which is in Afghanistan, and he died uh, in 165 years after the Hijra of Prophet Muhammad, which is 782 AD. So he was the king of Balkh, and a whole world was under his command the whole empire was under his command and it said that 40 gold swords and 40 gold maces were carried before him and behind him one night he was asleep on his royal couch at midnight the roof of the apartment vibrated as if someone was walking on the roof who is there shouted ibrahim ibn adam king ibrahim ibn adam a friend came the reply I've lost a camel and I'm searching for it on this roof. You're a fool. Do you look for the camel on the roof? Cried Ibrahim. And then the response came. Heedless one, answered the voice. Do you look for God in silken clothes, asleep on a golden couch? These words filled the heart of Ibrahim ibn Adam with terror. And a fire blazed within him and he could not sleep any more. It's such an interesting account that I'll actually carry on uh, reading it from the um, the original source if I can uh, uh, just pull it up here. So he, he stated this, and uh, well, sufficient to say this had a great impact on him. A number of other incidents took place, which led him to then dramatically reevaluate his life and his purpose. And as a result of these incidents then sure faith was established was established in him and once out on a hunting expedition he had another one of these experiences where he was he was galloping off and he left the soldiers behind him and uh, in a vision then uh, he heard a voice and it said awake and he carried on galloping on his horse and it came again awake and he kept on going trying to escape this voice and it came again awake and he couldn't escape it, and it drove so hard into his heart that he 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 was transformed. And it said that he dismounted, and all of his garments and the horse itself he left, and were dripping with his tears. He made true and sincere repentance. Turning aside from the road, he saw a shepherd wearing felt clothes and a hat of felt, driving his sheep before him. Looking closely, he saw that he was a slave of his, one of the slaves of Ibrahim ibn Adam. And he bestowed on him his gold embroidered cloak and bejeweled cap, together with the sheep, which he was herding, and took from him, the shepherd, his clothes and his hat of felt. These he donned himself, he put them on. And it's said that the angels then stood gazing on Ibrahim and stated, What a kingdom has come to the, come to the son of Adam! They cried, he has cast away the filthy garments of the world and has donned the glorious robes of poverty. And it's said that from then on, he went to caves and he prayed in caves for numerous years before he went and he went to live in Mecca where he died. And there's other amazing accounts in his life. And that again is from the book, Tadkira Talawliya, Memorial of the Saints by Farida Deen. Farid al-Din Atar, which is referred to by, or on page 65, but for those who've read Malfouzat, 
the book Malfuzat, it's mentioned in there repeatedly by Hazrat Ahmed, peace be upon him, who, who will come to shortly. So we can see such a vivid account, which helps us to understand this is the Prince Charles of our day, or even more powerful. He was not just a symbolic monarch, but he was the governor and the, the, the head of state and the, the literal power of that state. And this was a mighty kingdom. This is the Donald Trump of his era, though his empire may have been smaller. Something had such a profound impact on him that he was ready to give up his entire kingdom. And we see this time after time in the stories of people who've sought spirituality. So what was it that had hit the heart of Ibrahim ibn Adam and had hit the heart of, um, of Al-Fazil ibn Yaz, who we talked about earlier as well? So if we go to the next slide, then we see a number of the scriptures in Islam and in the other books, the holy books, which give us a sense of the spirituality which transformed these people, the lives of these people. If we go to that next slide. Please, thank you. <clears throat> so these, these are the slides which are talk about a purpose to our lives and what has Islam and the messengers said on this. So if you look at the Psalms written by Prophet David, peace be upon him, you see some incredible things about these points about purpose in one's life and also finding something which is not impermanent but is permanent, which you can hold on to in this life. <clears throat> and it said, he, he, Prophet David said in the Psalms, verse 103, a person's life is like grass. It blossoms like wildflowers, but when the wind blows through it, it withers away and no one remembers where it was. Yet the Lord's gracious love remains throughout eternity for those who fear him. And then a similar <clears throat> theme is touched on in, in the Dharmapada, the, the Buddhist scripture in chapter 8, entitled The Thousands, where it says, Better than a hundred years of ignorance is one day spent in reflection. Better than a hundred years of idleness is one day spent in determination. Better to live one day wondering how all things arise and pass away. Better to live better to live one hour seeing the one life beyond all the way. And then in the Holy Quran, you see a similar theme in chapter 28, verse 89, which states, and call not on any other God beside Allah, beside him. There is no God but he. Everything will perish except himself. His is the judgment, and to him will you be brought back. So this is a very interesting um, connection. And, and if you think back to the verse that was recited, Surah Al-Asr, then you'll remember the translation, which was, by the fleeting time, surely man is in a state of loss, except for those uh, who believe and do good deeds and ex exhort one another to uh, patience and exhort one another to truth. Uh, or exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patience. And so you have this theme here, which is very interesting. And, I, and, 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 and perhaps it's useful to just reflect on what this means. So if you, if you are a, an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old, 50, 60, 70, 80, um, then it's a similar theme, which is that time goes so quickly and your hair becomes gray so quickly and you lose your hair so quickly and your body starts to age so quickly and you grow so quickly and your children grow so quickly and your parents age so quickly and your grandparents even quicker. And before you know it within the, like this, we are 70 and then we are 80. <clears throat> and this gives us pause for reflection that everything will perish except for what? Is there anything that will be permanent? And these are the sorts of questions that arise for everybody at some point in their lives. And the question is, where does the West look for the answer to these really deep questions? And the most important questions that any human being can ask themselves, do they have any purpose at all? Or are they purely a freak 
um, aberration of chance and that you are here as an animal to eat, consume and prepare for death, at which point you will never think or think again or live again. And that's the end of your life. And those are questions to be asked. One might humbly suggest. That then takes us on to the next topic, which many people will be asking themselves in the West, and they do ask themselves in the West, which is in relation to the issue of life after death, <clears throat> which we talked about earlier. Um, and then we, we see the topic, a question's come in, which is, would you say, what would you say to those that say Islam is narcissistic? In reality, you've heard those accounts of Ibrahim ibn Adam, you've, you've heard those verses of the Holy Quran, well, where God Almighty is telling us, if we go back a moment ago to only the remembrance of God, to hearts find rest, and the verses of the Psalms where it says that everything in this world blows away and ages and dies. In reality, you can't be narcissistic if you're aware that every part of your appearance and your wealth is all is all ephemeral and is all going to come to an end. That's the antidote to narcissism, is to realize that that's plain stupidity, to, to place your, your, your worth and your value in these material things. And then that's the similar point of an element of fakeness in our actions, which is another question, do we create our own reality? If yes, what is the true reality? We, we do come to that in a moment, but in reality, or, or it can be suggested, that actually what is the what is the thing that Ibrahim ibn Adam, what is the thing that Fuzail experienced? It was actually the authenticity of their own soul. And it was overcoming the fakeness which they'd found in their lives, whether robbing people and gathering their wealth, being a king surrounded by wealth, or being a wealthy Englishman and, and acquiring more, or an English woman and acquiring more and more goods or cars and seeing those cars age and then getting a new one and then realizing, gosh, I've only got a few years before actually my car's going to outlast me and I'm going to be in the grave and someone else will be driving it even. So these these things actually remove the rust from our hearts, you might, you might say. So uh, hopefully that answers those questions that were mentioned. So then going to that point on a life after death, which is one of the key spiritual questions many people will have in the West. If we go to the next slide, we see that there are many questions which, which people will ask and we'll ask ourselves whether we are Muslim or non-Muslim. And these are, for example, some of them can be, will I cease to exist when I die? Will my thoughts and consciousness completely disappear when my heart stops beating? Or will a part of me remain? If so, what part and how? And what about my loved ones? My mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters and my spouse? I know that they will die, but will I never see them again, never hear their voice, never again hold and embrace them? How do I know that this is the case? Because it's a fact, or because my society in the 2020 West has told me this, but how do they know that there's no life after death? Is there an alternative perspective on this? And this really matters because this is literally life and death. So how can I know the truth? Nothing gets more than more life and death than life and death itself. So this isn't about uh, uh, employment or, or about uh, anything that, that's trivial. These are very, very pressing issues. So how do we answer some of these questions? So there's an interesting story, again, an account, a real account, historical account, which took place. And this is somebody experiencing death and somebody who just found out that they were about to die and they inform their daughter that they're about to die. And this is very important because if you think about our culture right now at this time, death is a huge tragedy for us. And it's hard not to be. Even as a Muslim, death is tragic, right? That's what we are told. And that's what we think. And it has to be the case. And of course, when I say it, and just some examples, you know, Kobe, Kobe Bryant died last year in America. It traumatized America. Princess Diana tr died 20 years ago. The country was overcome. Two years ago, 
um, a very, a very, very nice lady, very, a very, very honourable lady. Her name is Rachel Bland. She presented a podcast called The Big C and Me, and she passed away. And to be honest, your heart, my heart broke when she died because she talked about how she received this news of her being given a cancer uh, diagnosis and that she was at a wedding and that she had to drive home from that wedding. She had her son in the back seat, who was two or three, and, uh, and she had to think about him. Now, our society shouldn't have to deal with this stuff without any answers. And, uh, uh, you know, we as a society need to think about how we're going to deal with this before that day comes. Because that day will come for all of us. And we need to work out how do we deal with these things. These are not light things. And, and uh, Rachel Bland passed away. September 2018, many others have passed away. And this is nothing light. She was a, an amazing woman from all of the people that saw on her podcast. Her husband was a very special man, is a very special man. And my condolences to him and to his family and to the families of all the people that were mentioned, Kobe Bryant's family, Diana's, Princess Diana's family. It's not to make light of those things, but the question is, how do we deal with a cancer diagnosis when it comes? That's what spirituality is all about. So this topic here, this and this this account helps us a lot. It absolutely reverses the thoughts on how we deal with death. So let's think about it and consider whether this uh, helps. So this was a, a man, and you all will know this man. His name was Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Peace and blessings of God, of God be upon him. And he had a daughter whose name was Fatima. And there's an account in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is a hadith, a saying of Prophet Muhammad, chapter 61, verse 130. And it said that the Prophet was uh, in the midst of a fatal illness. And he called his daughter Fatima and told her a secret because of which she started to weep. Then he called her and told her another secret and she started to laugh. And when she was asked about it, she replied, the prophet told me that he would die of this fatal illness soon. And so I wept. But then he secretly told me that from amongst his family, I would be the first to join him. And so I laughed or I smiled. Now, that was a long time ago. That was 1500 years ago. But that is the kind of thing that we will all go through. If you have kids, there'll be a day when you'll when we'll need to say son, daughter. My time is near. I'm going to die. And when that day comes, how will we deal with it? And are we going to be able to, to smile? And if not, would we like to be able to smile? And if we want to be able to smile, will it be out of an artificial mind trick, which we've created for ourselves, which is be strong, be stoical, handle this. There's no point in being soft. That's incredibly brave if you can do that. But is there another way where actually there isn't any reason to fear, but actually there's this reason to be to be to smile as Fatima did. So if we go to the next slide, then there's some some points here which we can consider. The next one after that. So in the Dharma part of the holy Buddhist book, it says, whoever follows impure thoughts suffers in this world and the next. In both worlds, he suffers and how greatly when he sees the wrong he has done. But whoever follows the Dharma, the Dharma means the path or the way. Every prophet said they brought away. They use the same term. Whoever follows the Dharma is joyful here and joyful there. In both worlds, he rejoices and how greatly when he sees the good he has done. For great is the harvest in this world, and greater still in the next. Then in chapter 4 it says, Understand that the body is merely the foam of a wave, the shadow of a shadow. Then in the Holy Quran, chapter 18, verse 19, it says, like God Almighty says and told Muhammad, I call to witness the evening twilight, and the night, and all that it envelops, and the moon when it becomes full, that you shall assuredly pass on from one stage to another. If we go to the next slide. So these are poor, these give us pause for thoughts on these topics of life after death, spiritual questions that we ask ourselves. 
Then the final topic in the next, uh, before coming close to coming in close to closing, where does that take us from there? And a number of other questions arise when we begin to think about purpose of life, life after death, becoming a better person, particularly purpose of uh, to life and life after death. We may ask ourselves, if there is a purpose to life, from where did this purpose originate? If there is a life after death, how did this afterlife come into being? Is there something, if there, if, the, if, the, pardon me, is there something in, in, in this universe which is permanent and beyond life and death? If so, is this thing a being? And if so, is it conscious? If it's conscious and I am conscious, can I communicate with it? If so, how? If I now believe in a universal consciousness, do I actually believe in God? If I talk to that consciousness, if I talk to that consciousness, doesn't that mean that I pray to God? But how can I know for sure that God exists? Do I have to rely on blind faith or can I know with certainty that God exists? So these questions naturally arise when we ponder upon, is there a purpose to life? If there's a genuine purpose, not just one that we construct using our rational minds, if there's an, a real underlying purpose to us being on this earth and us existing, lots of other questions come from there, including this question about where did all of this come from? What is this permanent thing which goes beyond this temporary life? And how did that afterlife come into being? And is it possible there is possibly a universal consciousness? And if so, how do we know? And all of those things become much more relevant to us when we begin to think about life and death and the life that we lead on this earth. It's no longer irrelevant. It's not about going to church and praying on some pews to be, a, for whatever reason, uh, good or bad that one might do it. It's a literal life and death question which, we, which becomes the most important priority for us to engage with. So I want to give just an, another story, another account. <clears throat> Um, keeping the time, so I'll go through this quickly. So this account is of Hazrat Ahmed, peace be upon him. Hazrat Ahmed was another of these messengers, according to many Muslims across the world, who look to accept all of the messengers who've been sent in obedience to the Holy Quran. They've accepted Hazrat Ahmed as one of those messengers and one that was prophesied to come by many of the other prophets, including Prophet Muhammad and Jesus and Moses. His name is Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, and he lived in India in a place called Gadian. And he, he was born in the 1830s. He passed away in 1908. And he talks about an incredible experience of prayer. And it's the following. He states that Abdul Karim was the son of Abdurrahman, who was from Hyderabad in India. And he was a student in our school, in the school which was, which was run in the village of Gadian. He was bitten by a rabid dog, a dog with rabies, and he was sent and we sent him to Kasauli, where he underwent treatment for a few days and then returned to Gadian. But a few days later, he began to show signs of madness that are peculiar to being bitten by a rabid dog. He became hydrophobic and his condition deteriorated rapidly. I was deeply moved out of sympathy for this poor boy who was so far away from his home, and I felt a special urge to supplicate for him. Everyone thought that the poor boy would expire within a matter of hours. Inevitably, he had, be, he had to be moved out of the boarding house and placed in a room far away from other people. He was given great care and a telegram was sent to the British doctors at Kazauli inquiring if there was any remedy available for his condition. The reply came by telegram that there is no remedy for him and in particular, they stated nothing can be done for Abdul Karim. In short, the condition of absolute reliance on Allah was vouchsafed to me, Hazrat Ahmed says in his prayers, and when concern for him, this boy reached its ultimate limit and anguish took hold of my heart, the patient, who had been as good as dead, began to show signs of recovery. He who had been so afraid of water and light at once took a turn for the better and said that he was not afraid of water anymore. He was given water which he drank fearlessly. 
He then performed ablution with it, offered his prayers and slept throughout the night. His frightful and wild condition disappeared and he recovered completely within a few days. Knowledgeable people affirm that it has never happened that a person bitten by a rabid dog exhibiting the typical symptoms of rabies has survived. Can there be a stronger proof that the fact that the physician specialist officially appointed at the Pasteur Institute of India, Kasauli, had in, re in reply to our telegram categorically certified to the effect that nothing can, could be done now for Abdul Karim? So this is a very powerful example of the teachings which have been given by all of the prophets and all of the messengers since the time of 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 the beginning of spiritual messengers in reality that god is not something you rely on in terms of blind faith but actually you can know him as a certainty as an empirical proof and that you should develop certainty of faith in a sense the exact exact replica of our modern day scientific mindset which is empiricism and that you should empirically determine the existence of god through spiritual inquiry and if you do not come to a clear answer in this life, you will not get a clear answer in the next. Because in reality, there can be complete certainty to all of these questions of the purpose of life, life after death, the existence of God here and now in this very earth. And this is the purpose of spirituality. But going to the final slides, 24, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the question of what is spirituality? So, Hazrat Ahmed stated in the philosophy of the teachings of Islam, page six, he said, spirituality is the stage when the soul of a person being delivered from all weakness is filled with spiritual powers and establishes a relationship with God Almighty without whose support it cannot exist. As water flowing down from a height on account of its volume and the absence of any obstruction rushes with great force in the same way the soul at rest flows towards God. That is indicated by the divine direction to the soul that has found comfort in God to return to its Lord. It undergoes, a it undergoes a great transformation in this very life and is bestowed a paradise while still in this world. As this verse indicates in its direction to such a soul to return to its Lord, it is nourished by its Lord and its love of God becomes its nurture. And it drinks at the fountain of this life and is thus delivered from death. So to summarize, going back to the initial points, why seek spirituality? So the answers that we've come across through the through the, the the spiritual messengers and the examples we've looked at are the following. Firstly, to become the real you, a better, kinder, less selfish person, to be true to yourself. Secondly, to determine whether there is a purpose to life, to your life, and if so, to fulfill it. Thirdly, to find out in this life whether there is a life after death, and if so, get ready for it without having to die scared. And fourthly, to confirm whether or not there is a universal consciousness, aka God, and if so, make him your closest friend. So then why accept Islam? And why accept these messengers? And the answer to this is given by Hazrat Ahmad on page 24 of the philosophy of the teachings of Islam, where he says essentially there's only one goal to Islam and there's only one goal to religion and nothing else. And this is the only purpose of Islam. This is the only purpose of Jesus' is coming, the only purpose of Moses' is coming, the only purpose of Muhammad's coming and, and all of the other prophets, Krishna, Buddha. And it's the following. The purpose of, in this case, the Holy Quran, but all spirituality, was to elevate savages into men and then to equip them with moral qualities and finally raise them to the level of godly persons. The purpose of all Quranic insights and admonitions and directions is to raise man from his natural condition of barbarity to a moral state and then to lift him from that state to the limitless ocean of spirituality. So this is the purpose of spirituality or this is the purpose of Islam, to attain spirituality. And as mentioned, it may be that you, like me and many other people, are asking these questions. And very humbly, this is what you will find if you investigate spirituality. So why not give it a try? And very humbly, in my own very humble um, view of life and, and, of my, and of my own experiences that I myself have tested these things, 
then um, there's nothing else worth living for apart from answering those questions. And that's what spirituality is all about. And that's what Islam is all about. And that's how those things all connect. So thank you very much. And back over to you, Nadim Rahman, brother Nadim Rahman. Um, Jazakallah, um, Jazakallah, uh, Jonathan Saab, uh, for your such an informative um, and excellent lecture that provided us the opportunity or our viewers to reflect about life. And it related such a considering the current affairs matters in this. Although you've been um, answering all the live questions, uh, I've noticed. Um, however, there's one question uh, that I would like to ask on behalf of a viewer. So if I may, with your permission, read that. Um, the question is, in the light of the terror levels which is being raised this evening to severe in the UK, how can our community raise awareness of the true teachings of Islam being far from the terrorist attack playing out across Europe again, uh, which can harden anti-Islamic sentiments? Yes. <clears throat> So there are numerous different ways of answering that question, but I think that in reality, if we look to these examples that we've considered of the of these holy people that have been mentioned in this in those in in this in those slides, this lecture, then the the thing that we clearly saw with them is that they first of all relied on God Almighty, and they prayed to God Almighty, and in reality, these are spiritual diseases which have entered people's hearts to enable them to go and to attack and uh, murder innocent people. So first and foremost, it requires a spiritual solution. And in reality, this is how Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, um, Buddha, Krishna, Hazrat Ahmed brought about revolutions in their own times, beginning as we say, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, merciful, with prayers. Without prayers, then there's no success. But with prayers, God Almighty can resolve all of these issues. Then secondly, it is in reality telling people about the true, the true teachings of Islam. And, uh, and in reality, Islam has nothing to do with this abuse and this barbarism and the, these attacks. And it's about having those conversations at every level, in households, with friends, with associates, with work colleagues, then in the media, then on a political level and in the newspapers and at every level that we can, telling people this. But the point again is that Islam and spirituality is not limited to Prophet Muhammad. Our, our understanding is that in reality, this is a spirituality which is universal, which covers every country and all people and covers every messenger and has nothing to do with these kinds of terrorist attacks and barbarity. The other very important point is that actually all of the things that are happening are very accurately, have been very accurately described as, 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 come, as, as prophesied by Prophet Muhammad 1500 years ago. And he described how his ulama or how his scholars would be the worst people on the face of the earth. And he described how the mosques would be full, but their hearts will be empty. All that will be left of the Holy Quran is its script. When people pray, they will pray like chickens that peck the earth. He said that that um, that amongst the leaders of the Muslims, they will be the worst people on the creature, the most creatures on earth, worse than the apes and the swine. And in reality, it's they who are inciting these twenty-year-old children, young men, to go and commit these atrocities. They're not coming up with it of their own volition. It's actually coming from. Um, these twisted ideas which are being promulgated by these scholars. So when one studies Islam, it doesn't actually make one doubt Islam, but it actually shows the humanity and the love and the compassion of Prophet Muhammad because he said that these things will happen. And when they do, he told us what to do at that time. And essentially, he said that at the same time that God sends these terror attacks and these atrocities, God will also send somebody to the earth whose purpose will be to bring faith back from the Pleiades or from the stars 
and to bring together the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims and people of all faith under the banner of peace and of, of, um, and of true religion, to bring all people back to God and that his jihad would not be the jihad of the sword, but the jihad of the pen and that his name would be Ahmed. And so when I was talking about this individual, Hazrat Ahmed, that is the person that Ahmadi Muslims have accepted. And in reality, as a Muslim, then we look at Islam and we think, how can you solve it? We can't solve it. It's far beyond us. Nothing that the Muslim scholars can do will, will bring this to an end, because in reality, the, the trial which is already at play, they've already caused it to start, and now as a domino, it's spreading all around the earth. But in fact, God Almighty has said that there is a way that this will be solved, and it's through him himself, through God Almighty himself, he will bring it to an end by sending a Messiah to the earth. And in the same way that Jesus reformed the tribes of Israel, this Messiah will bring all of the world back to God. So this is the purpose of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and that's the message which we preach and we convey. Right. Jazakallah, Jonathan Sub. Um, we are actually have to extend the time for it. So, um, but anyway, uh, we would like the um, dear viewers for the your uh, watching uh, this lecture. So Jazakallah for that. Continue to watch these lectures. The next lecture, uh, Urdu on Monday, 9th of November, which is the importance of and blessings of Waqfish Jadid by Faz Amazaid Murabi Silsla Sahib. And the similarly English lecture is on Tuesday on the 10th, again on Waqfish Jadid, its purpose, history, and impact by Fahim Anwar, Secretary of Waqfish Jadid, UK. Now I would like to hand over to respected uh, Secretary Talim. UK, Nadim Rahman Saif, any closing comments? Jazakallah, I would like to thank you, Jonathan Saif, you for your uh, lovely lecture. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As -salamu alaykum. Yeah, yeah. You can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I would like yes, to yes, thank yes, you, yeah. Jonathan Saif, for your lovely and inspiring lecture as ever and obviously dear viewers and if i could humbly request you to lead us in silent prayer so we can conclude this session yes please join me in silent prayers Amen. Amen. So Amen. Jazakallah, viewers, and inshallah, we'll see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.